just go and I can just go and upload it. Okay, cool. We are recording. Awesome. Uh, welcome to Helia Working Group, uh, the April 11th, 2024 call. I don't know what number we're at, but we've been meeting weekly for, for a while now. Um, I am on my laptop. I've got a, um, uh, my wife's friend is in town, so uh, things are a little bit different. Usually I have a little better camera and I'm not like sitting in my bed. So apologies for that. Um, but yeah, we've got our agenda. Let me see if I can share my screen. Working off of one screen is very challenging. Let's see. That's, that's what a um, problem right there. Yeah. <laughs> Great browser. Is that? So I've got the Notion pulled up here and then I'll just edit it in my Notion app just to, just to make things easy. Um, let's see, okay, whatever this, this view is fine. I'll just increase the size. Can everybody see everything fine? Cool. Okay, good. So we've got a few items on the agenda. As always, please go ahead and add any items. If you have anything you want us to discuss, uh, otherwise go ahead and post in, in chat, um, any questions or you know, issues you want to talk about and, and we can add them in there. Uh, yeah, let me go ahead and update the attendees real quick and I'll give Did people a, a second. Link? You stick a link to the notion oh. in the chat. Yes, yes, yes. Um, now I got to find the chat on my single screen. There we go. Cool. I can't edit that page. Oh no! I'll I'll share the other I'll show the other link in a second. Where's um, someone else got it? Okay, cool. Nice. Also, um, as a little aside, um, it would be very nice if Luma would let us keep our our sort of like alias, the Helia dash WG, and just point to like the current Helio working group meeting. Um, we should we should ping them about that. That's not going to be possible. I've already spoken to them about it. However, there is a trick. You have to tag each Helia event with the Helia tag. And then you can um, you can just link to the uh, like community calendar with the filter on. Ooh, okay, sweet. Okay, awesome. Well, that that solves that problem. Awesome. Uh, Luma linking to current Helia. Use Luma tags tag events. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Uh, Let's hop in. I haven't seen any any updates. Um, ooh, I really hope Alex is adding a demo for sessions. That'll be dope. Um, I put it in the notes. It's in there. I don't know why I haven't updated. Because Notion's rubbish. Why are we using Notion? I need a refresh. Um, I hate it. I hate it. I might need to refresh. Oh, there we go. Um, Next. I accidentally logged into an Atlassian website earlier today and I thought, oh, how, how soothing compared to Notion, which is just like, what, what's going on? I miss, I miss using it, at, at, um, at, Atlassian, yeah, stuff, I can't even pronounce it, Bitbucket. Um, okay, cool, so we got this, we got this, uh, issue open and this was kind of mentioned when I, uh, did a very unsafe thing that Alex and I went back and forth on GitHub about a little bit. But uh, yeah, uncaught exceptions in Node, very bad idea. Um, uh, yeah, but anyway, we're doing it right now in Helia HTTP Gateway, unless that code was removed and I missed it. Um, uh, but yeah, we 
we're doing a few things right now. Helia HTTP Gateway is not quite ready to consume on NPM. Like we're using it on, uh, currently to publish the metrics here for this probe lab um, tool that's querying websites. You can see that uh, Helia using trustless gateways is you know faster than Kubo in most instances, but that's because it's like really deferring a lot of the work to backend servers. But um, when when these other ones were working well, uh, that was also performing well. Anyway, that that's kind of our targeted use case right now. Um, I think it would be great for us to publish this as an NPM package and and start like talking to people about that. Uh, most of our focus has been on the service worker gateway, and that will probably remain true and and like service worker gateway. But then at its core, Helia verified fetch. And so as we're fleshing that all out, Helia HTTP gateway is getting a lot of those benefits. And then this has also been uh, a good testing ground from what I hear from Alex for testing out uh, libp2p and doing like load testing and stress testing of, of um, you know, requesting a ton of content. So eventually we do want to publish the NPM and I kind of wanted to chat about here, like, does, does everybody agree with that? Um, and also... Like, what are the requirements that we should have for that? Like, is it just gateway conformance and then we go? I think that's enough to be going on with. Like, does it, it's, you know, is it, does it do what it says on the tin? Does it not fall over when you run it? I think that's enough. And then, then we can get some feedback and, and iterate. Like, I would like to thoughts? see results in Tiros that were comparable to the other implementations using the various options. But really, yeah. just correctness would be good. Totally. Well, yeah, I yeah, think correctness means the conformance tests, right? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay, yeah. So conformance tests, and then that kind of bridges into the next item. Um, but yeah, I think we would release this as Helia HTTP gateway. Um, and it, you know, it might still live at this particular repo probably will, you know, but, but yeah. one thing, uh, worth uh, thinking about. So I've noticed this with like verified fetch. I think it was super important that we scoped it under Helia, but like typing it sometimes can be quite a lot. And so I don't know if like IPFS dash gateway is available, but if we can squat that um, to, I don't know if like we can do multiple NPN names, but uh, just throwing it out there that like having a shorter command for like NPX is always like nice for users. And I know we have the JS IPFS like server or gateway, but maybe we could do like, um, IPFS slash JS gateway for the repo. Let's then... not publish things on NPM that have JS in the name. NPM is JS. Yeah. Yeah. But what about all yeah. 1 billion WASM packages that are all written in something else? It's JS totally too. There. It runs in they're, JS. They're totally there. Like... Are they prefixed with WASM? <laughs> um okay but yeah we can we can decide on that later i think yeah just just like thinking about the like the milestones that i created for the service worker gateway which for any later viewers um inside of our service worker gateway we now have milestones that we've broken the issues out into tracking like progress for what needs to be done before we actually release that or or start you know advising people to use that um, but yeah, I think we could do the same here, but it sounds like it's like, it's really just gateway conformance. And then once we finish service worker gateway, um, and, and verified fetch and get a lot of that done, Helio HTTP gateway should get that for free, free famous last words. Um, okay, cool. Yeah. So then, so the next gateway conformance. Uh, I have been doing, um, I've been doing some testing locally and I was able to um, like 
find some some gaps in coverage, not necessarily, I guess, bugs in the code, but gaps in coverage for how, I mean, it's a bug from the viewpoint of operating as a IPFS spec compliant gateway. But yeah, I was able to like load the gateway conformance fixtures and I have JavaScript files for doing this now in service worker gateway and Helia HTTP gateway. And there's the JavaScript reverse proxy, which would allow us to do like the subdomain um, requests uh, in like a, a test environment. Um, and so I'm wondering like if, if one, is everybody cool with me pulling that into verified fetch? I've asked this a few times, but I wanted to like get this on this call and pulling that into verified fetch. And uh, if so, um, like into the interop tests, does it make sense in the interop tests, Alex, or would it make sense as like a, a separate sort of gateway conformance package inside the mono repo. Can we run them like as an can we like package them as an external thing? You know, we have like interface compliance tests for like all of the P2P stuff, and they're just like exported from another module, and then those are run against all the various implementations. So then we could run the gateway conformance test against the HTTP gateway against a service worker gateway against verify fetch itself. Yeah, it, it's kind of set up like that right now, but it it um, via Docker and then Go, it requires um, some finagling. So yeah, packaging that up as its own sort of like NPM package that can do the things an easier interface across like verify fetch, service worker gateway, Helia, HTTP gateway. Yeah, that'd be nice. I like that idea. It kind of just be like a, you know, JS dev interface for the gateway conformance tests. That's not, um, I mean, it still might use Docker under the hood or something, but. So I feel like that would be maybe the next level, like after I get it working well in verified fetch, is there like an inter intermediate place that would make sense for them as, as maybe we work towards that shareable test? I don't know, why don't you just create any repo? Like as ever, like you don't want to block features being released from like one thing because of another thing that needs doing. Like if we have to ship bug fixes with verify fetch or whatever, and we don't want to then block on having, you know, like some interface test or whatever that breaks other things. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I'll see if I can, I'll see if I can package that up as something separate and, and then start using that inside those packages. And that like, yeah, just having some place to consolidate that code will will really help because I've got stuff in like um well mostly two places now but okay um and then yeah I need to talk with I guess some of the some of the go people on the shipyard team about some gateway conformancy stuff and I need to dive back into that but I've been focused on the um service worker uh no longer this url but okay can you can this screen share thing like go away it's in my way it won't minimize um okay let's see issues and then milestones so yeah was talking about these milestones earlier yeah i've been mostly focused focused in here um so yeah that's that's kind of where my work has been going and and then that kind of surfaces up into verified fetch. Alex has been, I think, targeting Helia HTTP gateway, doing like a bunch of uh, lib P2P bug fixes and various things, um, and then surfacing those up through verified fetch as well. So that's cool. I mean, yeah, I didn't imagine that would be a long convo, but I guess done there. Helia sessions update or Anybody have any questions or comments about what's been discussed so far before we hop into sessions? Gateway conformance. I have a NPM quick package. note on, on the conformance. Because um, uh, 
the context uh, on the gateway conformance test we have right now is that they've been mostly transplanted from Kubo. Um, and the approach when we created gateway conformance test suite was uh, it's better to port too much and test too much rather than uh, to create gaps when we disable sharpness tests in Kubo, right? So the, there, there may be behaviors, and we've seen that like this week in uh, like Boxo, even in uh, like Boxo gateway itself, uh, there were like tests which are super like, Kubo specific, and you could tell they were like kind of like moved without uh, deeper analysis, which is fine. But uh, like over time, when we have, especially now when we have like a second implementation, there will be cases where the gateway conformance test it's like failing, but maybe it should not be in the conformance test from 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 right uh, fr from the beginning, and we may be adding tests for areas which are not co don't have enough coverage for example like range requests may, may have gaps but at the same time we may have overly prescriptive tests in the conformance for example one example is html directory listings i'm pretty sure we are still like checking if there are specific strings on the in the produced html that was kind of like a, just a quick way to making sure that our existing uh, implementations do not did not like regress. But uh, now we have a s implementation in uh, in Helia uh, that's uh, effectively like uh, written from scratch. We, we may not want to like just blindly implement the same strings just so that conformance uh, passes. So if you see something like that. Uh, reach out to me or Enrique and or like feel issue or even a feel to open a pull request that uh, makes those tests more generic and we can like improve the gateway conformance test suite as well because that's like a, a, a big benefit is that we improve the conformance test suite along with uh, creating this new implementation yeah totally yeah thanks for the context um yeah I think I think you know, that was the right approach for then. Um, me not being a gopher, like I would love to hop into gateway conformance and I have a little bit, um, but yeah, just learning like, uh, that's an aside. I feel like I need to learn like all of the nuance and, and different decisions of how like the go test tool works itself along with Go, along with gateway conformance, just to do anything with gateway conformance. And that's like, that's a lot of yeah. stuff. Yeah, there is there is a DSL which aims to be kind of like, make it more friendly to people who are not familiar with uh, like Go. And by just like looking at test, you may be able to fix simple things, but don't kind of, like, it, it, that is to say, don't spend like, don't sink time in this. If you, don't uh, see an easy fix, just feel an issue in the conformance repo and like ping me on yeah. Henrik and we'll get it from there. Thanks. Okay, cool. And so you and you and Henrik are mostly maintaining this now, right? Uh, yeah, because uh, more or less we we, we in Box OK2 implementation, which is used by Kubo and Rainbow. Uh, and we test that mainly with the gateway conformance. So we are probably the most familiar people right now. Okay, cool. Good deal, good deal. Awesome. Okay, yeah, so I guess last item then, Helia Sessions update, and Alex is gonna give us an amazing demo. <laughs> this demo is amazing. I'm just right. gonna take the screen off here. Okay. For, as you can see, it's all expenses spared graphics here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start, I'm running the HTTP gateway uh, code. So I'm just starting the server. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, can you all read this? Yep. Can you can zoom in just one level? So if I made the thing small, it would make it bigger on your screen. Does that work? Or is it just tiny on your screen? It works. I mean, it's the it's text bigger. is a little bigger. There we go. I'm going to make it bigger. That's really right, anyway, big. So, yeah. so we've got, uh, so I'm curling IPNS ibvs.io, v for verbose, l to follow, redirect. 250 milliseconds. 
it requests the HTML from the page. That's all right. Nice. Yeah, remember when, like, you know, in the olden days, you were supposed to be targeting 100 mils for your 100 milliseconds for your, for your web page load. That's okay. I can do it again without using sessions. Six hundred eighty three. Mm. So with the sessions it's significantly faster. That's awesome. That's it. That's the demo. Oh yeah. Sweet. Yeah, that's awesome. Why are the why do the sessions make it faster as opposed to just less noisy? I, uh, thought, I thought before it was just like YOLO broadcasting to everyone. Yeah. So that broadcasting takes up time. Uh, whereas with the sessions, we're only sending to you know some select peers, so it becomes a lot quicker because we're just we're just doing less stuff. The key to any JavaScript performance is do less stuff. And yeah. it, it's interesting to tie this back to this whole discussion. I took a screenshot because I was worried that we we'd lose that whole discussion. Um, but what's interesting, I guess, is in the gateway, it's easier for you to create sessions and to make use of them in contrast to just the S like the API, the JS API that we expose, because you don't know what the user intent is. Whereas with the gateway, there's a good chance you're loading a DAP or a whole website. And then you can always scope the requests and create sessions based on the root SID and the path, right? Exactly. So the, um, I just opened the PR to, so this is actually, so the, the sessions are running in the gateway, but the session store is actually in verified fetch. So I've stuck, I've just opened a PR to verify fetch, which failed obviously because it needs the next Helio release. Um, cause I made a few improvements, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but yeah, so it, it, it keys the session on the URL that you're trying to load. So it takes whatever you're trying to load, it turns it into an IPFS path, throws away the, the actual path. So it's just like the protocol, either IPFS or IPNS, and then either the CID or the, the IPNS name that you're trying to load. And that becomes the key for the session. And then next time you make a request uh, that has that, the results of the same session key, you get you get the same session back. So you'll be able to load an entire website from one session, which is kind of what we're aiming for. Yeah, that's tight. Um, I love that. So what's the reason to tie this to like a specific, to like the, the URL thing as opposed to making it more like, abstract like user choosy like as an example i don't know if it would be helpful or not but it'd be an interesting experiment to see like if you in the service worker gateway you could decide that you actually want to try like what like a session for like loading the loading the DAF and all of the related assets versus just the um like the single page Right. Or similarly, there's the page and then there's all the assets that are within that graph on the same page. So even if you were like, I'm just going to stick, I'm going to stick here, anything that's under this graph, but not move out elsewhere. Yeah. Like yeah, maybe so... you have, instead of a CDN URL, you have like a, a, da a CID for your, your vendor assets or something stored elsewhere or shared among peers. Um, yeah. So like, so the, the session handling is, like I say, it's in, it's in verified fetch and it's keyed off the URL. Like Helio itself has no opinion about how you manage your sessions, like for this very reason, so that people have the freedom to experiment and do whatever their DAP needs. Um, so, you know, you could expose a thing in verified fetch that lets you choose the session key for a given request. And then, then you can do anything. Yeah, if we do that as a as a function that allows people to kind of customize that for their own needs, that could be useful. I definitely find if you try and be smart about things, you generally find later down the line that you weren't quite as smart as you thought you were <laughs> at the time. So definitely try not to have opinions about stuff. Like that. Nice. Cool. Um, yeah. So this, there's one thing like so this. Uh, yeah, that thread is slightly out of date. As I was saying, you could not, uh, like if, you, if you're requesting a DAG that you knew in advance was only going to have one block. So like if you're requesting DAG JSON or, uh, well, not DAG JSON specifically, if you're fetching JSON or raw, 
then you're pretty sure that there's only going to be one block behind the CID. Um, so the the bit swap spec says what you're supposed to do for a session is ask all of your connected peers, do you have the block for this? And then ask like routing, do you can I get some providers that have the block for this? What I found in the testing is that the peers that you have are generally not, they generally don't have the block that you're after. Because the peers that you have generally are ones that are dialing you asking for blocks. And so they found you, but you you haven't found them, if you see what I mean. Um, so what I found is much faster is just to do the routing query first and start asking those peers. Well, you just you assume that those peers have the block because they're rooted, they're they're in those providers. And if you fail to dial them, then you can search for more. Um, and that definitely speeded it up quite a lot. And it also means that you then you don't pay a tax for um for asking like network peers, do you have the block? Because you've already you already have a reasonable assumption that they do because they came back as providers in the first place. The BitSwap protocol, like the BitSwap spec doesn't say anything about sessions at all, is my recollection. Looking at it now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't think it has any of that in there at all. I think it, it I think there was some like the like bitswap 1.1 spec that was from you know whatever like three two three years ago or something maybe had like a bunch of like i caught somebody copy pasted stuff from the go bitswap code base however long ago it was which was pretty stupid and that was all removed because it's as you mentioned implementation details of the thing um right i was reading out docs i was not making it up so I can find the links and send them to you later. Okay, but I was so not I'll get... that up. Oh, okay. So I shall get fixed because they're they're not they're not here anymore. They there used to be garbage, I think, that was in there, but it's they're not here in the spec specs anymore. Um, cool. But yeah, the the session like BitSwap not having sessions doesn't mean that we shouldn't wrap, you know. Bit swap with sessions necessarily. Sessions are our implementation details that make sense. Yeah. Like when they do. I mean, as an example, so this the the like when when do you do optimistic broadcast? Uh, versus when do you do sort of like looking at the routing system depends on like what is your routing system, who are you connected to, and like even like what's the history of who you're connected to. So for example, Rainbow separates out, um, it still does broadcast to a bunch of people before it does routing lookups, but it segments sending those routing requests, it's sending those requests out to people that it's requested data from in the past, rather than A, people who've requested data from it because it's not serving data. Um, and also not from like DHT peers that it's querying because it's only doing it from peers that it's actually gone to and fetched actual bytes from to serve in the past, right? Um, or like the various like blockchains that are using uh, BitSwap underneath because everyone is expected to at the end of the day have the same shared state, right? There's frequently like the, there's no explicit routing system at all. Um, and so, broadcast sort of like broadcast sort of makes sense because you're expecting people to actually have the data you're looking for when you ask them. Um, whereas, you know, broadcasting bits off a quest to anyone you've encountered in like the amino DHT and whatever is like excessive because they probably don't have what you're looking for, which is why you want, you know, sessions is sort of like the entry point when you can. And also the smarter your the smarter your application is at choosing the sessions, right? The less broadcast you have to make, because then you don't have to like um let's call it guess to repair the session. Where like, you know, 
you don't want to go to the routing lookup system again necessarily for finding the JPEG on the page you just visited. All right, when you load the HTML, you don't necessarily want to go hit the routing system again for the JPEG. Right. Yep. Yeah, and, and um, w one question I had about the, the sessions in Helia is um, I know there was discussion on um, getting HTTP and HTTPS um, multi adders from peers like that's we're we're good to go. We're fully like using Helio routing. Um, any any multi adder or delegated routers like are going to fill this session with providers, right? Um, so what I found is that actually the the providers for CIDs with HTTP addresses are very few and far between. Um, I think it's not even worth turning that on at the moment. Like, I think it will get better with the, the libp2p HTTP stuff that like Marco has been working on. Um, but like, it's, it's, it's a weird one as well, because it's going to have the same problem that WebSockets have. Like you need HTTPS for this to work. So you would have set it up explicitly. And there's like a handful of those things. And yeah, but those are usually like um, provided by the big pro uh, content providers, uh, which do have resources and time and uh, infrastructure to have like HTTPS endpoints. So for example, I think like Pinata, right? Or was it like Web3 Storage? No, it's, they it's, are. It's mostly Web3.Storage and and yeah. uh, a bundle of Filecoin storage providers that are doing. Yeah. That. Yeah. So it's like. You can count them on the fingers of one hand, but then they have a lot of CIDs. And then they're not, are, are they, they not haven't, exposing? They haven't been coming back in results for, you know, Filecoin.io, IPFS.io, blog.ipfs.io, that kind of thing. Yeah, because the, those are hosted on Flick, and I don't think those websites are pinned to Web3 Storage. Um, but, you know, um, maybe I, I don't know that this JPEG, uh, the, this, I think the second result will be, um, uh, the web free storage, uh, gateway. Yeah. So it could be like opportunistically, if you are able to like, just do HTTP instead of, uh, um, p 2 p maybe useful. Even though there is like a small number of them, it may be beneficial. Yeah, we like, have to like have metrics for this. Yeah, yeah, like we have to be careful. Because I was gonna, I was thinking of just changing. So th things like also, I don't know if you, I saw a post in the lobby earlier, like uh, our uh, our uh, HTTP delegated router is taking like more than ten seconds to respond to like provider queries. Um, sometimes, which like if For you're the, trying the, to... the streaming ones as well, uh, whatever the default is, I don't know. Um, uh... But like, it, you know, when you're trying to target sub 100 milliseconds, obviously 10 seconds is is an eternity. Um, so yeah, it's kind of useless at the moment, if I'm honest. What I was what? thinking of doing was just having it be quite aggressive with timeouts. And then just like falling back to using all the the default block broker, so it looks like you're getting a it looks like you're getting a session, but you're not really. But it does work, which is nice. I would make sure that you're. I would make sure that streaming is turned on in the clients, right? That we're requesting, yeah, with the uh, ND JSON and and not for JSON because. Uh, yeah, like you don't want to be held up on like a um, sort of like a, a tail query, basically, when you probably, you know, if you get the first re provider result back in like, you know, 50 milliseconds, but the last one comes back in five seconds, like you should just kill the query once you've had enough. Yeah, this is why we need streaming in all the things at all times. All it should be streaming first. So this, yeah, so this one is, uh, yeah, it, it, I thought in the JS queries it was using streaming, but we should make sure that that's, that the code base is doing that by default. Okay. 
options. Well, we cannot do that by default because that will make uh, those URLs useless in browser. The content type will trigger a download and you no longer will be able to like just send a link to someone. No, I mean the the libraries, the the Helia library should be using. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. By they should like explicitly set XF header. Yeah, I believe it does. It should do. Yeah, we can. If it does, and if the first query comes back and that takes ten seconds, that's like very concerning. Um, yeah, I mean it only waits for one, one provider. Yeah, it's requesting um, NDJ Zoom. I mean, it could just be that the servers are on fire. Where's the code? Where Where is it requesting NDJ Zoom? What's the link for that one? Oh, it's still this library. Got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alrighty. All right. Um, so yeah, I, look on, I, yeah, let's on poke it down and, and see what's going on here. I had a potentially naive question um, related to the the HTTPS and HTTP multi adders returned. Um, is there like is do we need to be serving this over HTTPS? Like if we're just serving bytes, like why, like why not, why serve it with HTTPS where you need to do um, handshaking and other TLS termination and things like that? You'll get like mixed content warnings on, on browsers and stuff. I mean, I, I guess there's two answers, right? One is that, you know, transport layer encryption is generally a good thing from a privacy perspective. And the second is Google doesn't care if you disagree with it because of the thing where it, you'll get mixed content warnings. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a W3C thing too, not just Google, right? But yeah, it's, sure. a, good, it's a good thing. Yeah. Um. But yeah, okay, yep, makes sense. Uh, for some reason, I thought that we weren't using this library anymore, but maybe I, I just haven't like touched or seen this one in so long. Been wrapped by Helio routing and stuff. Yeah, light a link to this for secure contacts in browsers. Uh, basically, like, yeah, if you've ever tried to, uh, you have your website hosted on HTTPS or something, and then you try to fetch from HTTP or try to load a HTTP resource or something, you know, they could eject uh, something into your secure context. Um, yeah. Makes sense. Yep. Okay. That was pretty much all the stuff on the agenda. Do we have anything else we want to chat about or um, anybody have any tidbits, uh, any any learnings in the last week or, you know, insights using Helia or from the community or anything they want to discuss? I think River like popped in last week and Daniel, you chatted with them. Is that is there anything you want to discuss about about that? Yeah, um, I mean, it was a pretty like high level conversation about the broader landscape of DAPs and, and you know where IPFS fits into that. They're doing already content addressing for some of their like images and user uploads. They're, they're using Web3 storage for that, um, but they're not doing uh, verification on the client side. And I think one of the things that came up was um, performance. Um, and so he was already complaining that uh, loading from Web3 storage is slow, which I actually found to be quite uh, strange because I was under the impression that they're using Cloudflare to do to handle a lot of the requests, and I'm pretty sure like they still need to do some kind of like an AWS 
round trip in order to get like the index of the block to deserialize the car file that they store like in the cold storage. Um, but again, these are like Web3 storage implementation details. But I was like, okay, well, if Web3 storage gateway, if the Web3 storage gateway is slow, then I don't think verified fetch will be any faster. If anything, it'll be slower because it's doing requests block by block. And especially if some of your assets are like multi-block, then uh, you're going to have to pay a performance cost. And what was so interesting about that conversation was that it was like, okay, but what fits then? Like, well, you, know, you get this resilience, you get censorship, censorship resistance, but none of that is valuable to him if the whole DAP or the whole app that he's building, like River, isn't re properly um, decentralized. And so it was just like an interesting conversation, but it was a bit of a hard sell to get him to like embrace verification on the client side. I, mean, I would say like it doesn't, if you are storing with one provider and you're not expecting or really caring if anybody uses a tool like Companion to allow fetching from other providers. Because I think when we saw that was like hard coded in the Web3 storage provider, right? Which means the only way to like get data from anywhere else would mean would mean something a tool like Companion intercepting the request. Um, you you like you know you're not necessarily getting benefit, but if you're also complaining about your provider sometimes not being as fast as you want, then probably you'd like to be able to try getting from say two providers, right? And if you try getting from say two providers, you probably, you, you can race the requests and download them in parallel. You could try getting range requests from both of them, but that seems kind of sketchy because like if one of them has an issue or sends back something weird, you've now like corrupted the joint combination of the images uh, of the of the different ranges. And so at that point, like verification starts becoming more interesting because you're like, I can add in more options for where this data comes from. Even if the fallback, right, I start I start with this provider or these two providers and then I fall back to elsewhere, right? Um, but again, like these examples that you're describing become a lot more involved and require a lot more implementation work on his behalf. And he's an app developer focusing on delivering value. And so like... You know, the, in the broader like context of him developing an app, it seemed like a lot of this is just irrelevant noise, especially because he's doing a lot of the EVM state indexing using, I forgot the name of the tool, but like a, but essentially it's like this open source thing that does it in the background and then, you know, pop Postgres database. And so the whole discussion around this was like, well, you know, if you're using a Postgres database, none of this is really decentralized and and then it became and the conversation shifted into uh, the topic of like okay how do you give your users credible exit with car files right like you want like the thing that you truly care about is maybe not that resilience or that in browser content addressing you know benefits maybe it's just you want to give your users the ability to truly own their data to do that, you know, maybe you can provide them with some car export stuff. Um, but then it's like a question of like, okay, most of the structure that links all of these uploads is coming from the EVM and then indexed by this open source thing into Postgres. So like, do you now have to create a new structure, kind of like the Facebook take your data export feature, where it's like, do you now have to like structure that maybe with like DAG JSON or DAG Seabor and like, you know, essentially link up all of the user uploads. Um, and so like we went in that direction, but it just, it seemed like every direction that you go in, it's like, well, it requires him to like suddenly download all of these concepts onto his mind. Um, and he's also, just I like... Depends. I think the question is like, so I mean, this is true with, with a number of these uh, call them like, like blockchain based things. So let's call it this way, the many of the, if you're building an application that's reliant on chain state, right? The ability for you to run like a, you know, relatively full IPFS node is much easier than running a full insert blockchain here node for the most part. Um, like, and so there tends to be someone, 
there has to be some some infrastructure, something behind it that does a bunch of the work that makes it easier on, on something like a browser or like an end user. Um, and the credible exit there, right, is that like, okay, you could always stand up your own node with your own thing. And so if I publish some source code that says, this is how I do the, in this is how I do the indexing and how you could too, then like, that's your exit, even if, even, a, even if it's somewhat painful. Because if another community springs up, say rather than each person running it themselves, then like the community can can deal with running that infrastructure. Um, and so I think the maybe the exercise on credible exit you'd run through if if that's something that you wanted for your users was like, given my code is here, what would it take for someone else to run an instance of this and have it functioning? Is that code, yeah? I think that was also the way he was approaching it. Exactly as he described. So it's like, okay, we publish all of the, you know, the transformation code for Ponda, that's the name of the tool. We publish it, you know, as part of the GitHub repo. Yeah. yeah. So but can they so can they move their data? The answer is yes, because the data was, you know, is either on the is either on the chain or anchored to the chain with CIDs. And then then that's all good, right? And you can use you can do car exports, but if the data is on Web three storage, you could also use like a sort of like a pinning API thing to be like, I internally say I need all these CIDs. Go find and fetch them from wherever they are. Which turns out to be Web three storage, right? Because um, probably coordinating the mass download of all of the car files with that their specific API is more work than you may necessarily want to bother with. Especially because yeah. again, the, the exit doesn't need to be like super fast. You're not running it all the time, right? You're doing it like once as an export. And so if it's like not optimized for their infrastructure, then like, you know, it, this isn't like the regular occurrence. Yeah, yeah no, totally yeah. agreed. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for recapping that, Daniel. Um, yeah, and some good chat there. I, I read a blog post um, talking about like real um, user sovereignty of, you know, your data and your, your digital persona um, and credible exits. That was really good. I forget the blog now, but um, yeah, I think like um, a lot of like, this decentralization blockchain and dApps and things like that like like people can can boot up apps quickly but um you know it's really easy to do the centralized thing the like non local first thing the the like just stored in one place thing and i think you know helia is in a really good spot where we you know enable local first development a little bit more so than um you know a lot of uh tools out there you know with ipfs um not ipfs tools but other tools in general like helio with ipfs enables local first a little bit better and i think we need to talk maybe it's just me but i feel like we need to communicate that from that angle a little bit more and telling people like like we always say oh hey run your own node um, you know, or, you know, run your own node on the back end, but like, that's, that's what, you know, people, people balk when we say it, but that's what like Bitcoin did. That's what Ethereum does. That's what pretty much all blockchains do. They have a bunch of different validators and nodes running that make it work. Like that's, that's how you get decentralization. Sort of, but they um, also like, just like yeah. use Infura, right? Like, like in practice, right? They do the centralized thing, yeah. Yeah, like in practice, what happens is they, you know, the blockchain stuff is they're mostly are choosing infrastructure providers to do that because running your own like Geth node and whatever is like a pain. Um, yeah. So how do how do we make it not a pain for for our users and and Helia? Like, do, do we? Do we need like a targeted sort of project plan going that way and make sure that we're setting that up? Are we already like keeping that in mind with WebRTC and things like that so we can have more distributed nodes 
you know, running and, and helping with content. I think it's like asking like maybe like what Daniel was, was having, saying in this or about his, his conversation was like asking people like what what do you need from this tooling and, and why? And then giving people the ability to like take only the parts that they need, right? So like if what you wanted was like yeah. Um yeah, if, if what you wanted was I can move my stuff to other providers, you I guess just need you you need CIDs, but then you need okay, but in your application, where's the thing that hooks up that says I can download from somewhere else? Is it like an environment variable that points at a new storage provider? Like you would for a wallet where you point at a new wallet provider? Like, sure, may maybe that's all you need, right? Uh, if what your application needs is like, I want it to be up, I, I am okay with things being slower instead of when there's a problem, instead of being down when there's a problem, right? Um, you know, if you host a website and your website is with, you know, a given provider and that provider has a bad day, do you want the website to be down or do you want it to load a little slower? And they say, okay, I'd rather it load a little slower. Then you say, okay, well, we have other tools that we should give you to enable that, right? Um, and this is like giving people the, not making them take everything. Like, I think part of the issues they've been struggling with, with like, with, IPFS is people who are sort of like trying to take Kubo out of the box and be like, this does all the things I need. And then it's like, except sometimes it does too many of the things you need. And sometimes it doesn't do quite enough of the things you need. Right. Um, and that's because like the whole thing is packaged together. So I think the approach with Helia around modularity has been, is, is going to be helpful in allowing people to like choose the pieces they need for the level of, um, you know, resiliency, decentralization, credible exit, whatever that they, they need. Yeah. Um, last thing, I guess I want to say, it's a little bit, um, it's not related to what we were just discussing, I don't think, but I, I did see some in, in Slack, I don't know if it was this morning or yesterday, but I saw somebody was contemplating um using Helia, was it an IPFS ecosystem or IPFS implementers? Somebody was talking about, hey, I'm looking like, do, should I be using Kubo and the RPC client or should I use Helia? And they were talking about there was, um, they were looking and seeing that there is active development um, in Helia, but that there may not necessarily be a large community is there anything that we can do to address that or like should should we be um i don't know how do I mean, we how should do we... lean into the things that we're doing and make it clear where we're going right so at the moment if you want to do if if you want to write your code in js or typescript or something and you want to do retrieval stuff you're probably going to be okay using Helia for your thing and you don't have to worry about spinning up another node next to you, right? And certainly that's where we're going. I mean, if you're even trying for to serve providing. a bunch of data, it's, it's, it's less, right? Like it's doable, but it's less do it's, it's, it's less. You have fewer options. If you decide you want to start using the IPNI stuff, that's not super there. I think it, I think maybe the, the tooling might be around somewhere because I know the Web3 storage folks are are like JS or bust and they're using IPNI. So maybe that's there. Um, but like, yeah, it, it's certainly doable, right? It's yeah. just less where yeah, the focus Yeah, if it's is. running on the back end, like if they're already, like if they already have the option of running Kubo, they can run Helia, you know, in Node. And I don't know if the web transport stuff has been fully done there, Alex, or if you're still, yeah, working with the, uh, fails components um but yeah like that that's the only big gap as far as like transport the, the thing is if you're in node you can use tcp but you don't depends really need like transport doing. yeah well, it depends on if what you're, you're trying doing. to if you're trying to dial a browser you use webrtc if you're trying to dial a server you use tcp 
Yeah. And Lila, I think Lila, yeah. I think the you asked if there was quick. I think I think quick and web transport is like a bit of a, a, a an ongoing it's a bit of an ongoing story. But that's oh, yeah. yeah, that's it. Um, has the there's a PR open, the latest one from like a month ago and against Node, and James Snell says he might have some time to work on it again in a couple of weeks mid late april you guys ever like did you guys ever wait for duke nukem to be released duke yeah. nukem forever and the joke was it turned into duke nukem whenever duke nukem if ever <laughs> it was a bit like that that's awesome i don't remember that specifically but i do remember when duke nukem came out well, when Duke Nukem Forever finally came out, it was rubbish. So hopefully, like, quick won't be rubbish when it's released in the post. Well, it what was the conversation the analogy about... could fail there. What was the Which conversation around web, around web transport, given that quick isn't in Node? Um, um, so, so there's a... Yeah, go ahead. There's a, there's a module... There's a guy called Martin Richter. Uh, he is active in the specification effort for um a quick uh, for web transport sorry um he runs he works for a university in germany he writes a he maintains like this set of modules for doing this lecture system that uses web transport and so he's written a node module that uses libquiche to, to expose web transport in node and it kind of works like there's a there's an open there's a i've got a pr against jersley p2p that adds this as of like earlier this week all the tests were passing for Node. Um, they don't pass in Windows yet, but they do on Linux, and it passes for me on Mac OS locally. Um, yeah, it's very so, rough. That's edges. so weird because because uh, Quick is underlying this, so it seems like you could expose if you can get web yes. transport. It seems like you so, should have a way. So there is there's issues open on on this repo, probably closed now, uh, where people said. Oh, you're using LibKeach. Can you expose quick? And he's like, I don't care about it. I'm not going to do it, but I will merge any PR that adds it. So when when web transport is stable in here, I was going to have a crack at exposing quick. Um, like maybe post um, Brussels JS Hack Week, something like that. You just like, you know, listen to some drum and bass, drink some coffee, and and have a go. Oh yeah, it's awesome. Um, I'm gonna stop the recording because we're at time. Um, so thanks for joining. If you're watching this from the recording, uh, you can find the the calendar um, on Luma, uh, Lou dot ma slash ipfs, and then there's some tag for Helia that I don't know how to do yet. Daniel will teach me. Um. <laughs> um but yeah, all the, the Helio working group meetings will be here. I need to create them for next week um, when I relearn how to do that. Okay, recording stopped. No, it, no, it wasn't.